welcome Ian. Well, thanks very much. Um, you know, delighted to be here. Hope the desert island is a warm one. It all started in South Africa for you, didn't it? Okay. It did really, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I think photographers depend on their luck and I was really lucky in that, um, although I went and I got a job working for the uh, Sunday Times group in, in South Africa, but I heard that a guy called Tom Hopkinson, who'd been editor of Picture Post in this country, uh, was coming out to edit a black magazine. And I thought this is a great opportunity to uh, learn something about magazine photography as opposed to newspaper photography. Of course, the flip side of that was that when he was at Picture Post, he had, you know, he'd worked with people like uh, Cartier-Bresson and Ocribu and Stas and so forth. And he knew Magnum. So when the magazine sort of uh, lost its appeal for both of us after a while, he kind of introduced me to Magnum. And uh, although I moved to Paris and uh, I didn't actually go there to work for Magnum, I went to work for a new agency which had been started by uh, the ex-bureau chief of Magnum who left to start his own crowd and he invited me to come and yeah. work there which I did for a couple of years. But you went initially to South Africa with a goal in mind? Was it just to travel? Was it just to open up? And your chance meeting through the family with this photographer who was sponsoring you, um, Roger Madden? Was that all just, all just come together? Was all, it was, just, was it just something which happened and you went, this is actually what I want to do? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, let's, um, let me be frank. It, um, I was, what, 16 years old or something. And um, I, I really wanted to travel. I didn't want to, you know, get in sort of family businesses involved in that sort of thing. And, um, well, the possibilities in those days, you could get cheap um, trips, yeah. cheap flights or cheap sailings to Australia, New Zealand, Canada or South Africa. Yeah. And I kind of thought, well, you know, I, I still had family in, in England and uh, Australia, New Zealand, long way away really. Um, Canada was a bit near to America and South Africa, I thought, well, there are going to be uh, lions on Main Street, let's yeah. go and have a look. <laughs> Two things happened there, I guess. You were learning a craft, but you were also learning a real insight into another culture and how they collided as well. And I think, was the world opening up to you there? Was that where you were going? Well, things have changed. Things are happening here, and I want to work them out. Yeah. Well, I, I, when I first, well, when I first arrived, um, I, you know, it's as I said earlier, luck plays a yeah. great deal in one life. And uh, uh, actually, you had to get to go to South Africa. You had to get someone to, to act as guarantor yeah. to make sure you, you know, weren't going to live off the state for the first year you were there. And the only guy that my family knew was this photographer, Roger Madden, who I didn't know. He had worked as an assistant to Ansel Adams, mm -hmm. who, you know, landscape photographer. I was delighted to go and work for him because he was an incredible technician, you know, his printing technique. So, I, A, I learned the technique from him. And also he was shooting as a, basically as an industrial photographer. Mm -hmm. And, and in those days, everything was lit. So I learned how to light, yeah. which um, is not something I'd ever even thought about before, you know. Um, and then um, after the year, I knew I didn't want to go on being an industrial photographer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I met this uh, German photographer, a guy called Jürgen Schadeberg. Okay. And um, uh, we, we got chatting. He was working for, uh, uh, for this African magazine that Hopkinson came out to edit. But uh, he'd been offered a job on a, a newspaper, a Sunday newspaper for Africans. And he asked me if I was interested, and I thought, new experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, the curious thing as a white, as a young white, you know, you lived in South Africa and... Um, there was no crossover of the cultures, you know. I mean, you, you, I didn't know any Africans really, personally or socially. And this seemed like a great opportunity to learn something about the country. Mm. So I went to work for that and uh, it lasted a year and probably because of my photography, it went broke. 
that's when I got on to the Sunday Times group uh, and subsequently Drum Magazine with uh, Tom Hopkinson. With the Sharpeville shootings, you were, were you working for the Times group then when you did the Sharpeville? No, uh, I was uh, actually working for Drum. Yeah. And it happened at a time when I had a weekend off and Tom called me and asked me if I'd come in uh, because there are other, yeah. the other photographer on the magazine, Peter Magabani, who was an African, and he'd already gone out on something else, which was too far from Chartville. So he called me up and said, you know, would you go and have a look? We don't know what... I mean, at that time, one guy had been shot, and that was the sum of it. So I whipped out there, and, uh, you know, half the world's press were there, all the agencies, and... Uh, guys from Time Life, um, and, but nothing was really no. happening. Anyway, I, I got there, the guy who'd been shot had long since moved, and we were all standing outside the township, because um, in the same way that an African in a white area had to have a pass to be there, uh, a white had to have a pass to go into an African township, yeah. and none of us, of course, had a pass. And we were standing around, and the army quasi police army guys turned up and uh, headed into the township so we thought well let's have a look and everybody about a dozen cars I guess we jumped in and followed these guys in anyway we'd only gone a few hundred yards when the guy in charge came back and said look you know you don't have a permit get out of here or I'm going to arrest you so all but three cars left we went on a bit further and the guy stopped again and said, this is the last warning, um, out of here or you're arrested. So the two of the cars left and we were the only car. So we, we had a slightly better, you know, feeling and an idea of, uh, of the, the whole scene. So we followed him in and uh, I got uh, Humphrey, the, who was a sub-editor on the magazine, to go around and park behind the police station. I walked around, chatted to the guys who were standing around. They were friendly enough to me. Although, you know, I have to say I was an obvious foreigner always. You yeah. know, if you're as weedy as I am and not a rugby front row forward yeah. and uh, had a hair a bit longer than... There wasn't, a, there wasn't much load between the press and the Afrikaans were there at the time? No, yeah. not at all. Anyway, the Africans were quite happy to talk to me and I, sh I stood around for a bit, took a few pictures and uh, I kind of figured nothing going to happen here. So I walked right back around the police station to the Humphrey who was sitting in the car and said, I think we might as well go, there's not much going to happen. When suddenly, uh, we were just parked on the edge of the, the field next to the police station, suddenly the shooting started and... Um, at first I thought either they were firing blanks or they were just shooting over the heads because I hadn't seen any reason for them to be shooting people. And it was only when people started to fall around me that I realized they weren't blanks. So I had two Lycos with me and um, one with a 35, one with a 50, which was the extent of my equipment in those days. Uh, I immediately ran out of film on the 50, went on shooting on the 35, and I just photographed people running towards me. Mm. Um, you know, as photography, it, uh, no great pictures. I mean, the only odd thing was the, one of the guys running towards me had his jacket held up over his head. He seemed to think it would protect him mm. from the bullets. And then, of course, afterwards, the body's lying around. At that point, uh, I thought, we'd better go, because um, I, uh, been offered to be shot before by the yeah. police and I thought I'm the only witness standing in the field yeah. um, and we pushed off we didn't know our way out of the township actually yeah. we were a bit nervous to ask but we stopped and asked some Africans and they couldn't have been more friendly they directed mm -hmm. us out and we left and that was it and so the only good thing to come out of it it's ironic or it's odd to call it a good thing was but the police then arrested all the wounded people who had been shot in the back uh, running away uh, they made uh, accusation they charged the people with it an affray on two occasions they didn't 
exactly tell the truth. Nearly everybody was shot in the back. They were mm -hmm. running away. The police said they hadn't been, uh, they'd only fired once. Well, in fact, they'd fired twice and I had pictures of them reloading. Um, you went to court with all this, didn't you? So I went to court and, uh, I, you, know, I, you know, let's face it, those were the times in South Africa when yeah. to be white was everything. They believed me because I was the only white witness. So all the people who had been charged were dismissed. Yeah. And at least it was a, a small contribution. Yeah, yeah. From, I, mean, I think through living apart, you can see your association with the, the, the black African community. You can see it, it's just there. And we'll come back to that, but I think without sounding, in a way, um, making a true did everything of 60s with Sharpeville come to a head with you because you left Africa, South Africa officially as your residence in 61, didn't you? And you came back to Paris or England? To Paris, yeah. yeah. to Paris. Was that for you to, was that just because you needed to focus your career on something else and obviously your journey in Africa had just begun really hadn't it in, in terms of the documentary side and what you were about to pursue so you went to Paris and then you became the observer photographer didn't you the, you were observer photographer for quite a long time you joined Magnum and then you were yeah I worked out of Paris for a while and I had a couple of really good years running around the world yeah um, what I didn't realize is I'm a guy who's never had an idea in his head um, but the the guy um, in charge of this new agency, a guy called Michel Chevalier, was um, a brilliant editor. And he was just pointing me everywhere where right. things were about to happen. So I had a couple of great years running around the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then um, uh, I got a call from Mike. So tell me how your association with The Observer came about. At which led, I presume, towards your eventual shooting of Whitechapel and the English. Yeah, um, actually, I, I came, decided to come back to England because my wife was pregnant and I wanted, uh, wanted the, uh, the child to be born in England. Um, and I had a friend on the Observer newspaper, a guy called Bryn Campbell, um, and he was very kind to me. He sort of tipped me off that the paper was about to start a magazine and arranged for me to go in and meet the editor, editor-to-be of the magazine. So I, I went, chatted to him, they offered me the job. Actually, it wasn't quite that simple because I was still a member of Magnum, uh, but they offered me a 100 days a year contract, an England contract, I kept the copyright of everything um, and um, Magnum syndicated whatever I, I shot, which kind of worked very well. So actually I spent five years um, with that contract and it only uh, folded when they decided, as magazines do, that they wanted to um, syndicate the material themselves and they wanted copyright. So that was me out of the door. Yeah. But it was a good it was a good time. And in that period, it evolved Whitechapel, which was a, a big, another early project. And then did that lead on to the, the English? Yeah. I mean, well, what happened was I, um, initially, the first thing that happened, I was getting a lot of stuff published. Um, I still probably had more covers on The Observer than anybody else. And the Arts Council, um, decided to give a photographer the first phot photographic grant and luckily they gave it to me. Um, and then shortly after that the Whitechapel Gallery approached me because um, they had never had a photographic exhibition and their art exhibitions drew people from the West End as it were but didn't bring in local people. And they thought um, a photographic exhibition might do that. So at the same time of doing the 100 days for the Observer and so on, uh, I had time to run around the country shooting the English. And I, I think I'd proposed that to the Arts Council. Um, and so it was something I had to do to justify the... Uh, You're sort of looking at now at certain classifieds yourself, I presume, because Britain was quite... Strip wasn't it in terms of split 
in terms of yeah, very it, obvious class. It, it was a good time, and um, I, I was happy to run around. I probably didn't spend as long yeah. as I should have done on, yeah. on the book, but uh, it, it was done in between The Observer and shooting in Whitechapel. Yeah. Um, I would like, in retrospect, to have spent longer on it. I was keen to do it because uh, Robert Frank had brought out The Americans, the book on The Americans. I mean, this is early days of photographic books, you know. I mean, Cotier Bresson and Ernst Haas and so on, Eugene Smith were... There was a lot happening then, wasn't there? There was yeah. Frank, there was Minamata with, yeah, exactly. with, with Smith. And I, I can see that in your work a lot as well. I can see there was influences there with... with, with with Eugene Smith, especially. Well, I thought it was a good opportunity to look at the English because uh, I felt Frank's book... I mean, Frank is a damn good photographer. Yeah. But considering the things you can do in America, you know, the access to places yeah. you, you can have, you know, prisons, hospitals, no matter <laughs> where in America, uh, in this country you couldn't. I, had, I felt that he had not... It hadn't been a totally fair portrayal of America. It was a bit of a jukebox America, if you like. Um, and I understand it because he'd shot it on road trips with, with writers. And, you know, if you're on a road trip, mm. you spend your time in uh, cafes and what have you. And you don't sort of dig into prisons and so on. Yeah. But and, well, that, that brings us to the first shot um, from my neck of the woods. Can you tell us about the shot in County Down? Yeah, well, you know, I went to Durham and I really had no contacts and I was just walking around on the street and uh, I went to have a look at the, you know, the cathedral and so on. Um, and the light was interesting. It was that sort of low, late afternoon light. And uh, I saw these three guys coming towards me. I mean, obviously ex-miners or more than likely ex-miners. Uh, all wearing their traditional caps, which were worn in those days. And I was able to grab a shot of them going past with the silhouette of the cathedral and so on in the background. Um, and it, it kind of worked quite well for me. Uh, and it was one of the pictures that I still like the most in, in the book. Um, it's got a certain poetry to it, doesn't it? There's a, there's a rhythm to it and, and yeah, a feel and it, to it. And it. It was very typical of the time. It, it really, for me, encompassed, you know, what was then sort of fading modern Britain, changing yeah. modern Britain, uh, together with historic yeah. Britain. And what was it, 30, 35 mil, 28 mil? Uh, I'm probably a 35. Um, and the, I sort of acquired another like a... <laughs> And I shot principally with 28, 35 and 50. Yeah. My 50, 50 was my long lens. Yeah. And you were exposed, it was quite a fast shutter speed as well, because you're exposing for the light, aren't you, really? Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know, it, it's, it was a good time to shoot, because in England, people tended to ignore you. Mm. When you were, f f you know, they were not aggressive towards you. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you were shooting in France, People were okay, but they'd come up and they want to know what sort of camera you were using and what sort of film you were... They wanted to talk to you. Um, you know, if you were in Germany, they would kind of look around and think, you know, were you from the Stasi? Yeah. Or <laughs> in yeah. Italy, they'd throw back their jackets and bare their chests and shout at you yeah. uh, in a good way. Um, but the English tended to ignore you, so you could get away with a lot. It's changed uh, a lot. It's changed enormously. And what film were you using now? Uh, this was Ilford. It, I, I don't know what we were at then. HP3, HP4. Yeah. Um, early days. Yeah. I've tended always to use... Uh, there was a time in Africa when I shot Tri-X because I think for some reason Ilford were not... A lot of British companies pulled out of South Africa, but Kodak didn't. And you could always get Tri-X. Yeah. But when I came back to England, I started using Ilford. Yeah. Um, I don't know why, but I, I like the film. It had a quality to it. It was a bit more grainy, but it had a quality that I liked. Yeah. There's a rhythm to the shot, and, and I'd like to see what was there before and after and how you sort of saw that. Well, you know what it is. If you're doing um, 
say you're shooting for a travel magazine or if you're shooting for yourself, um, there are two things. Either you see something very quickly and you grab it and try and make a shape out of it with whatever's around, or you have an interesting background which you like to include and you wait for interesting people mm -hmm. to, to go by. And I suspect the latter was the case here, that I was probably waiting and I probably shot other people going by, but the... You know, shapes an interesting yeah. way of looking at it, isn't it? Yeah. It's a shapes, it's all shapes, isn't it? That's absolutely. I yeah. mean, you know, it's, uh, it's great to have content and it's great to have the moment, but you've got to make a shape out of it. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you're just a snapper, really. Yeah. So this is our second shot. It is in South Korea, and I'm not that familiar with this shot, but what is interesting, and I've been around you quite a lot, it's colour. I remember when you were talking to me a long time ago saying, you know, I love colour neg. I love shooting a colour neg. Because I remember you went to China or something, and you were, shooting, you were taking colour neg with you, and you said, I can just do black and white, I can do colour. Do you think, how do you see that now, in terms of, you're shooting digital now, I presume, a lot. Yeah, indeed. You've got that option. Yeah. Haven't you? Yeah. This is colour. And do you like the fact that you can do that now? I mean, how would you like to see the shot in colour of black and white? Um, I have it in colour. And it's fine. But I, I, you know, I'm a black and white photographer that shoots colour because I spent years after The Observer, I spent five years shooting for Geo, or Geo, the German travel magazine, shooting cities and God knows what. and or colour, obviously. Mm. Um, you know, if you're shooting for a, a magazine like that, you shoot colour and you think about the colour. Um, but at the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, how will this be in black and white? And the great thing, well, starting with Colin Egg uh, and then going on to digital, yeah. is that you can produce great black and white from the colour. I mean, I, I've got cameras now that uh, I can shoot black and white in the camera. But I leave it on colour and I shoot colour and I convert it afterwards. I do remember at the time, transparency E6 was quite a nightmare to work with. Colour neg really came to the fore mm. and it was just like a breath of fresh air that you could play with this colour neg. I didn't have to worry about colour cast, didn't have to worry about getting detail in, in, in low light and getting detail in highlights. It's just give it all to you. It's like working with black and white film at the time and it was a bit of a freedom, wasn't it? Absolutely. I mean, you could leave your bag of magenta filters behind oh. and, uh, uh, you know, and just shoot. I, I don't really remember, but you and I went on a, on a trip for an oil, an Italian oil company. Was it the Black Sea or the Baltic? I can't remember. But we went across it, it and was... all you had to carry was the film, which, well, apart from the fact that really we, we, on that trip we couldn't shoot flash, I think, because of the, the oil. What we were doing, um, there were about a dozen people from Magnum doing a book on South Korea. It was enjoyable. I'd never been to South Korea before, and. Uh, at the end there was an exhibition and actually this was shot when I went back as they, they wanted one guy to, to talk about the exhibition and you know, give talks and so on. And whilst I was there I was working on another project on water and I heard about this um, mud festival and so I went along to have a look and like most festivals it was okay, there were fun pictures to be shot but then I heard about this um, crowd who were doing, uh, what do you call them, uh, companies do branding, no not branding, that's not the word, uh, bonding exercises. Yeah. Oh, right. And yeah. um, this crowd were doing army exercises and um, the poor sods were bankers. <laughs> and right. they were not they like army recruits. Yeah, uh, they were bankers <laughs> and they were, they were absolutely... Corporate outing then, wasn't it? Yeah, they'd had it, you know. <laughs> And I understand it because even you couldn't stand still because if you stood still, you couldn't get your feet out of the mud. What brings you to this shot? Because it's such a surprising shot. Watching these guys, and I have a few other really nice pictures of this crowd uh, looking really miserable. <laughs> um, 
I go for this picture. It's not actually the strongest picture, but it's the shape that I like. Is that what really, why you put it in your top end? Yeah. This is the shape it's the, the shape of it. Wow, okay. Uh, and you still have the feeling, because this person is absolutely knackered, and, uh, well, they all are, but they just stopped. Yeah. Um, and I was plowing around. You could hardly move, you know, yeah. so, so moving around so slowly. And I just saw this shape, and it was just so much better. It's interesting, when I asked you for your eight pictures, which defined, which you would take with you, I think you'd give me about 36 pictures in your initial, uh-huh. in your initial transfer to me. And I was like, yeah. I knew he'd do this to me. Yeah. And, but still in that 30 odd pictures, which you give me, there was a few pictures like in South Africa, which is the doctor treating the lady on the ground on the, in the floor. And that's just like, that reminded me of Eugene Smith. That sort of thing. And the young boys on the white only beach, they weren't even in there. And I was like, wow. I thought that was really interesting because we all perceive these iconic shots with you. We all see them and think, that's Ian Berry. And, but when you, this is what's beautiful about, I think, this, that you're, off, you're giving me this corporate outing in South Korea is one of your top eight. And that's just... It's interesting to find out why, you know, I think it's really interesting for me personally. Well, it, it all stems from one conversation I had with Gaudi Rezal. Um, he was a bit of an Anglophile and we, we got on personally very well. And we were walking through Paris one day, I can't remember, we were going somewhere. And we were talking about, and first of all, he told me I was walking too quickly. Um, He said, you've got to walk slowly because uh, people will, um, if you're going quickly and you suddenly stop, people catch that out of the corner of your eye. And that was my kind of first lesson. And then casually he said, look, if you shoot one great picture a year, you're lucky. And I kind of thought, smarty pants, I can walk, (laughs) walk around the block and shoot a great picture, you know. But of course, in retrospect, what he said was absolutely true. Um, you know, if you look back on your life, and uh, there are very few great pictures that you think yourself are great pictures. I mean, there are lots of stuff, you know, you photograph wars and, you, you know, you do all that stuff. You know, in, in the same way I can think of, um, of Vietnam Inc., Philip James Griffiths, and it's really good stuff. But then, you know, there's, there's that one great picture in the... There are several great pictures, actually, but the one you, that sticks in your mind. And, and that's now what I look for. I mean, mm. you know, why would I still be going on taking pictures when the editorial world is dead? Mm. I go on doing it for myself. Yeah, it's interesting. You think you know what other people think, but actually, we, when you get behind a photographer's eye and think about what, what was relative to him, it's... Well, that's, that's why, um, you know, that's been at the back of my mind uh, all my life. You know. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Is this, do you think this shot here was the, that sort of... Because it's at the beginning of Living Apart, isn't it? Mm. And, and Living Apart at the beginning, really, is about the divide, isn't it? I mean, it's about... You've all actually almost turned it around and you've made the white Afrikaners look a bit primitive. For me, this is my perspective. Whereas you've, you've really emphasised with the black community and you've given them a dignified perspective on all of it. You've really gone aboard with the construction of how you shot it. And for me, I've seen this picture so often in part of you and I knew it would be in your air. Is this a beginning for you, this shot? Well, early, early on, um Drum was an eye-opener for me, uh, for several reasons, but it, to start with, I was working with African writers, um, and I started to look at the country through their eyes. Uh, it, it, you know, we go on a, on a story out of, uh, out of town, and um, we couldn't even stop and go into a cafe and have a cup of tea together. At night, the, the writer would have to drop me off in a white hotel, and he'd have to go and try and find somewhere to sleep in the township. Um, so it did give me access to a lot of things, and it also got me sort of thinking how to, uh, you know, how to approach this. And at this point, although this is not obvious in this picture, I was trying to photograph how whites and Africans related to it. Not actually just whites and Africans, actually, because 
Afrikaans speaking, English speaking, and the Afrikaners hated the English speaking. Mm. They were still fighting the Boer War in those mm. days. Um, but also African Indian, um, you know, I photographed um, Africans burning down the Gandhi, the Gandhi sort of hospital and so on in Natal. The coloured people were more scared of the Africans when it was obvious that um, the change was coming, uh, that they tended to vote for the whites. But you could have done it a different yeah. way as well. You, the way you've gone in on it was really interesting. Though. Well, you know, you go, you, you go around as a photographer and you look. And I heard about this, uh, this cafe where actually some really good African musicians were, were playing. And I thought, I'll go and have a look. And I walked in the door and I had a 35 around my neck. Uh, I didn't want to be too obvious and I always under my, under my coat. And as I walked in, I saw this guy in the corner and I thought, oh, I'll go and talk to him. And then as that passed through my mind, there was the jukebox <laughs> uh, and this gesture. And I just picked up the camera and that was it. Um, I don't know what I was shooting at, maybe a 20th wide open or something. Decisive know. moment, really. I kind of 35, it's just, just yeah. the moment. Just, what does it sum up, though, do you think? Sorry? What do you think it sums up, this picture? Well, it, it sums up uh, a lot of, uh, you know, urban Africans. You know, there's no difference between urban Africans and urban whites. Uh, except how they lived at that time in the township. So when for the first time we heard that actually whites were coming to listen to the music, you know, Hugh Messicelli, people like that, I mean, really now top mm. musicians, you yeah. know. Um, and I, I kind of thought, I'll go and see what I could do. Yeah. And so I went, and that was the first shot I took. I was still yeah, standing I thought in the doorway. It might be. Yeah. You know. I think it was the beginning. For me, I can see it even. It's, it's just that beginning, because I think it sets the tone for the way you perceived the black community, the way you documented it. And it was, I can see it. I can, well, to be honest, I think it, it was Feiden who published it, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I think it's one of the best books I've ever published. You know, because. Living Apart is such a historical document, you know, like we've got the Mandela, and he's, he was a lawyer, wasn't he? You've got the chart in Mandela, and you've got the chart in how it, there was the, the, the total divide. And it ends with the coming together and the unity, doesn't it? It ends with give the black community a, a stronger platform in your pictures, I think. Well, you know, it was over quite a period. Yeah. I and mean, I went back, I don't know, six, eight times yeah, yeah. Uh, to shoot, you know, and I went back on one occasion to shoot for a German Geographic magazine to shoot the whole magazine on South Africa. I remember when you were doing that. So, um, uh, you know, I had a lot, of, uh, a lot of opportunity. But the difficult thing, what I had in my mind was blacks and whites did not meet socially. I mean, you know, you had a few liberal whites uh, there was a Liberal Party who would, you know, but essentially there was no cross communication. And so on the street was the only way you could do it. And that was always grab a moment, you know, mm. when it was just a, a sour look from a white to an African yeah. or, you know, what, just grab the moment, you know, I mean, I, I went to a, a wine tasting in Pau um, and the coloured, as opposed to African, the mixed race people who work on the, in the vineyards, they came in to the wine tasting, which of course was whites, for whites, with boxes of bottles of wine on their shoulders. And just to catch the moment of the, of the guy carrying the box, looking at the whites and seeing what he was thinking, but visually you could see. And, and I have to say, they, they took the boxes into the tent and every three boxes they bait in, one brought in, one went behind the tent. <laughs> and by the end of the day, everybody was motherless, sort of white colored, you know. You know, that, that was it, looking for that sort of moment. Yeah. Um, Which is, I guess, could take us on to Another bar? Yeah, I, I shot. shot. Uh, 
I shot these cities for Geo magazine and then sometime afterwards um, Stern magazine, the news magazine, they occasionally run a, a, a separate folio, if you like, in the back of the magazine and they do a city. And they asked me to do Berlin, which I love to do and it's one of my favourite stories actually. Yeah. I look back on, uh, I mean, you know, Magnum are doing a book on street photography and they, they want me to do Whitechapel and I really, yeah. it's a hundred years ago, you know. Yeah. But Berlin was relatively recent and um, it was great. East Berlin, much more exciting than West Berlin. West Berlin more exciting uh, architecturally, but all the old stuff was in East Berlin. And I was walking down the street at night and I heard this guy singing. It was summer and I thought I was going to have a look. So I went in, sat myself down and it was a piano bar. And uh, I saw this guy who was great value, and I liked the woman in the hat, and I started to shoot them, and it was okay. I got a few pictures, and, but it didn't really come together. And then I saw the, when I relaxed a bit, I saw these um, notes on the yeah. pillar in the background, and I figured if I could tie them together, it would make a decent shape out yeah. of the whole thing, and make it work better than just the pianist and... Uh, and the woman. And you were on like her there. I suppose having a range rider helps you see all this as well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, up until a few years ago, I only used Leica's. I went in and shot the picture. And the fun thing was, it ran in the magazine, of course, and I got an email from America uh, from the guy's brother uh, asking for a print and saying, next time you're in New York, I'm the head chef at this fancy restaurant in New York. Yeah. Come and have a meal on the house. Wow. And I did. Did Terrific. you? Of course you did. Of course you did. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> Big print. There you go. Yeah, in exchange. And this is colour as well, isn't it? This colour, yeah. yeah. Somewhere I know well, and somewhere I photographed around the same time as well. I, I think that's just before I first met you. Um, this is the... The yeah, Dockland, I, isn't it? Uh, I, had, I had an assignment from, I think it was Zeit, uh, Zeit magazine, the German magazine, to go and photograph uh, Canary Wharf and the effect it was having on the people who lived there, which was quite tricky. It was easy to go and photograph the building and the... It actually was, because I did the same thing at the time. The you know, time. and all that. I wasn't getting anything that just kind of got something of the architecture and something of the people. And I saw these kids playing around and I saw the fence that had been broken down and they were quite good value. And I was relating it to these houses here principally and the, and the building. And it, it was okay, you know, but you persevere and the kids hadn't seen me. I was in the middle of a scrapyard more or less, you know. Uh, and then these other two kids came along and started to shout at them, and then there was this gesture, which just kind of coming together. Put it all together. And, you know. Do you think it's still? A, it was an interesting time to photograph then, and, and it was there was a lot of transitions going on with communities at the time, and mm. and, be, and putting this. This was another one of them pictures which I thought mm, it's interesting that he's put this in. But, and do you think it was because it, they are difficult shots to get, and they are very. It's not an easy place to to sort of get the decisive moment and elements like this all coming together. Is, is that why, which led you to bring it into this age? Because it's a sort of, a, it was a little bit of an achievement as well, wasn't it? Getting well, it was in that, you know, I mean, you know, you know, I've always been sensitive to race relations ever since leaving Africa. Yeah. And, you know, I saw this white kid and the uh, black kid playing together absolutely normally. Uh, I mean, they were so involved in it, the kid had an ice cream. They were so involved uh, in themselves that they weren't seeing me. And, and then the other kids came and reacted and made the picture. Uh, I mean, without that gesture, it still yeah. wouldn't have worked. Yeah. But, um, I don't know, you know, the photographers in Magnum, I can say, get a lot of exposure, or did get a lot of exposure. People like Kodelka, Leonard Freed, uh, were the hardest working guys. They just shot and shot and shot and shot. And although I'm naturally lazy, um, when I'm shooting, I'm not. 
I, you know, I, I've actually watched you work a few times, and I remember when we were stuck on that gas wig in the middle of the Black Sea. Do you remember that? For Sapien, when we were, spent like, a couple of days living in that big gas wig on the sea. Do you remember? Mm. Mm. And I remember watching you work then properly, because I could step back, because I couldn't really do much just because of safety. So I had to sit and observe you rather than be at your side helping you. In. And this was, you know, like the, the corporate and stuff. It was really interesting to watch. What I did learn from you, actually it was a real turning point for me. It was about 97 or something. And like you never set anything up. I, I never witnessed you set anything up ever. Even in corporate environments, you sort of went, okay, oh, hi, I'm here. And then just do what you do and I'll do it. And you did that with these guys from the Polish kitchen guys to the, the Malaysian. Um, uh, workers on the, on the platforms pulling in the huge chains and the ropes and you didn't really set anything up you left it all per chance and you saying that you're not lazy but I, I didn't see anybody who when you when you're on the money or you're on the when you when you're shooting I don't think you are that lazy I think you work mega hard to actually make yourself really anonymous well I think reality am I right am I yeah no I, reality is always better than anything you can set up you know, I, editorially, I never set up. I mean, that's for me. I mean, I'm always amazed that photographers would go and put people against a white wall and go bang, and you know, yeah. <laughs> um, I, because life is so much more interesting. Yeah. And if you can, if you can capture a bit of reality, I think it's. But you don't really interfere with it, do you? You, you no, sort of step back and you, you like that sort of you like little. You like that secretive sort of, like almost invisible clock, isn't it? Like you've got. A, well, I, you know, I, I, I try to be, and and a lot of it is from you know, Cartier Bresson's move slowly, <laughs> you know, wear soft shoes. It probably means that you spend longer on a particular project, yeah. but um, hopefully in the end it's worth it. And it's not. It's not, you know, I'm not an illustrator. Yeah. You know, we've got photographers here in Magnum yeah. who are illustrators, and they're great at what they yeah. do. But that's not my, not cool. my thing. I, Another interesting shot. Well, this is a classic. Um, Liverpool, uh, 1984. Y yeah. I, again, I was working for a, a German magazine. Since I left the Observer, I hardly worked in England. I was working <laughs> for a German magazine, and uh, I was just photographing Liverpool. They wanted. They wanted a, a view of Liverpool. You know, I walked past the cathedral and, you know, obviously that was kind of interesting. I walked by in the morning and I couldn't, you know, it's just a, an object and I, I couldn't get anyone interesting anywhere nearby. Mm. And I walked by a couple of times in the morning just walking around the town. So you spotted the picture first. And I saw that first. Yeah. And I came yeah. back to have another look and bugger me, there was that guy standing in exactly the right place, yeah. you know, with the, his, shape, uh, the shape there. Yeah. It is second. I, I couldn't it? also the, the, the bit where the concrete pillar or something down and you've got just, that uh, just split sort of in frame. I, I couldn't have set it up. Black and white? I think I was shooting black and white yeah, then. 84. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it was for a black, what was the magazine? It was German magazine and uh, they wanted it in black and white. Yeah. So I shot black and white because that was... Um, it's another uh, interesting addition for me, then. But, uh, another and what's nice is that a lot of younger photographers may associate you more with African and the, the African work. And for me, I think it really landed you in, a, in another way, you know? And I think it's a book which a lot of people look at, and especially younger students. And, and because it's, it's actually not... It, it wasn't that long ago, you know, because it's quite current in, in, a, in, a, in a sense. And, and I think well, what's nice about putting this in is finding out a little bit behind pictures, which I never really associated you with, like I said before. And I find it really interesting how you've traveled all over the world, shooting all over the place. And, you know, you're picking that shot of Liverpool. And, and it means a lot to listen to what you're saying about that. And it's really right. interesting. I, I, I think I spent a week and I, I got three pictures out of it for myself. Um, one picture of a demo going past the city hall and uh, one of the black guys in the demo yeah. Sort of yeah. gestured, you know. 
and a picture, they were trying to show something of the awful modern architecture that was in Liverpool, modern yeah. then, uh, with the tradition. And I had a shot of uh, a couple of um, a couple of young kids, seven or eight, puffing away on yeah. cigarettes at the head of the stairs, and this terrible old building, and then the pillared classic building in yeah. the back. So it was worth it was worth doing. Yeah. It was a you know a good trip. No, no, absolutely. It, except absolutely. I have a, I'm a really card right thankful it's in there because it, it's nice finding out more about you, really. Right. So this leads us into 1969 in South Asia, Southern uh, Asia. It's actually I, it's on the, on the it's actually in the, I can't remember the name of the place. It's right on the South African border. Right. I was walking around shooting. I saw this African kid and uh, looking a little bit dispirited. Um, and uh, with the white kid sleep in the back of the car. And I thought, you know, who leaves their kid with an, an African kid with an, in an open car on the street? You know, yeah. <laughs> it was difficult to make it work. And I had to, I mean, I think it was crop there or something. Yeah. I had to make it work as a half as a shape with it. This yeah. is more a moment for me. Yeah. Just to say, we're looking at the colour and the black and white at the same time here, but Ian's chosen the black and white version. But yeah. We've got, we've got the colour one next to um, us. I, I, mean, I mean, you know, the tradition, it, it, the, the picture that when, during the elections, that brought Mandela to power, I went to the Telegraph magazine and on the cover they used uh, an African nanny, uh, a woman, yeah. with... Uh, a white kid who looked about 14 or 15, maybe a bit less. Well, usually South, in South Africa, white people had African nannies to look after mm. their kids. Uh, but usually when the kid was four or five, mm. that was more or less it. Yeah. But it was unusual in, in the picture at that time. You've got the Orange Free State picture of 94, haven't you? Which was the, that vertical shot of the nanny. And the young white kid as well, haven't it, which is... It, it, it it's kind of was always e interesting to look at, but this was my really early days. I mean, I, yeah. I guess I was a kid myself when I took this, more or less, in photographic terms. Did you jump in on that? Did you see it and just go boom? Or did yeah, you, did yeah, you work it a little bit? Or? No, it was one shot. I, I presume you shot it in colour then. Is this coloured? Is this in terms of, is this not coloured afterwards? Or this is how... No, I shot it in colour. What do you prefer? What, what does it... We're looking at the colour in the black and white. What, do you, well, I don't like that cropped. I mean, I no, can see why no, it's done. Yeah, of course. But, it's cropped um, on the front of the observer um, supplement. But um, I still think it's... I prefer it in black and white, but, you know... How does the black and white work for you in, with, in relation to the colour shot? Oh, it, it works much better. Yeah. I mean, you're, you know, you're not drawn to the colour of the headscarf yeah. or... Uh, you, you, what you get is what, what you see is what you get immediately. Yeah. You know, you're not drawn to the colour at all. What about the skin colour as well? I think it, it gives you a bit more of an equal level playing field. It makes you mm. actually work into mm. the little white kid. Whereas in this colour shot, you predominantly see our, obviously the scarf relationship is obviously black and white straight away because of the colour influence, isn't it? And yeah, that's they true. They really do work differently together. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I thought it might be a, a cup from the full frame. I mean, the the thing is that... Um, We're just looking through the... There it is there. I've got the full frame version. Yeah, so the colour didn't detract too much. That's slightly cropped. It's a beautiful um, colour of our car. It's beautiful. It, it, uh, yeah, but if that, you know, had been green... Yeah. Um, it would have screwed it completely. Mm. Uh, and that's, the, that's always the risk. It's a lovely argument to have what is, you know, just looking at this shot and looking at it in colour and black and white. And yeah, I mean, you know, some people would prefer the colour. It, it's, well, of course, the other thing was I was doing a black and white book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a bit of a no-brainer. as well. Why is it important to you, this shot? Uh, it, because in a way, it's what started me off really thinking about race relations. Did you see... 
So that have been a different light when you were living away from them and had to come back. Do you think it shed a different sort of approach onto the way you operated there? Well, things changed. Um, I, I had a friend who was um, actually a, an Estonian photographer, but living in South Africa. And we got on quite well. He was, I think, working for Sigma in Paris. Uh, and you know how it is if you're, often it's better to share a car or what, ha what have you. We, we ran around quite a lot. And actually, cynically, he spoke Afrikaans, yeah. which I, I don't. And uh, I obviously look a Brit. So, you know, he got me into things like the ultra right wing uh, doing arms practices and stuff, which I would never have got into by yeah. myself, you know. And, and, um, we, this was the run up to the election. Yeah. And we ran around, um, and it, it worked better for him if I was in English speaking situations. Yeah. Uh, because he obviously had a South African accent. Um, but, we ran around all over the country and, uh, you know, I, I followed uh, Bota um, and my name, my memory for names now, but uh, what's his name, the AWB, the leader of the AWB, ultra right wing guy. Clark? N no. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. but. Um, I was able to go to his meetings, and it's actually where I shot the picture of the African nanny looking really uncomfortable. Um, but we went around and we shot a lot of stuff. I mean, I shot a lot of stuff on Mandela, but my press pass, I think was 360 something, and I was there a fortnight before the election. Um, so. There were a lot of people photographing him, and most of the events um, were in football stadiums. Mm -hmm. And in those days, maybe still now, the football stadiums had wire netting separating the audience, yeah. the spectators, from the game. And he walked around in there, talking and waving to the crowd. Um, but you were shooting like this with your the camera above your head, and you'd shoot him and a uh, hundred photographers behind mm. who were rushing to catch up and you'd shoot and you'd rush and catch up. Mm. And it, it really didn't work, yeah. you know. Um, but we were traveling to, um, he was going to a university in Natal. We were traveling ahead of him to get there before. And we went through this town and I saw this poster. Yeah. Uh, and all the kids climbing, waiting to see him go through. And I kind of thought, you know, that's going to be much more interesting. You work with verticals quite well, don't you? I shoot a lot of verticals. Uh, always have done. Is there a reason? No, not consciously. I don't know why. Well, it, um, it, it kind of works and somehow for me it was more symbolic than... Uh, I did get one occasion, because I'd met him before, when he was much younger. Yes, well, um, you, you fought him quite a bit in the 60s, um, uh, And so, because I'd followed him around a bit, and I, he was good to talk to and helpful, and, and I, I got him one thing where he went to visit a sick wife of an ex-leader of the PAC, which was the competing political party. Yeah. So it was very generous of him to go and see this woman. And so I was the only photographer. So I got some quite good stuff. Yeah. And, and he went around hospitals and I photographed him. And so I, I had a lot of stuff. Yeah. But somehow, even with him not there, this was more symbolic yeah. for me uh, and worked better. And actually, as a picture, it sells yeah. all the time, you know. The last time I went back, I went again, well, for a French magazine. I went up to photograph the farmers just below the border with Zim and Afrikaans farmers. 
by a sheer stroke of good luck. Uh, I had a friend in South Africa and I emailed him and said, look, I'm coming out for a prime match, I think it was. I'm coming out for this French magazine. Could you introduce me to the farmers' union who might put me in touch with a farmer with whom I could stay? So he contacted the farmers' union and he told them this guy was coming from this French magazine. And so when I arrived, they thought I was French, <laughs> which was a big plus. <laughs> um, and they were really nice to me and they introduced me to this farmer with whom I stayed. And it was embarrassing because he thought I was French. Uh, and he kept telling me, you, you know, your English is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was tricky. And yeah. he also had knew a French guy who he kept meaning to bring to introduce to me. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> the guy will recognize my schoolboy French in about two seconds <laughs> flat, you know. But anyway, they were really nice to me. And the thing was that the farmers were being treated really badly. Yeah. Um, I mean, I went to one farm where the elderly woman uh, was in her 80s, the farmer. Her grandfather was buried on the farm and they were just chucking her off, just mm. dispossessing, uh, what's the word, dispossessing her. Yeah. And staying with this guy, it was extraordinary because when it, 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 the whole house was surrounded by razor wire, at night, he'd go out at dusk and fire off a few shots into the air to let any potential thieves know that wow. he was Where armed. was this, exactly? Um, this is quite recently. Uh, well, no, it's not recently. It's about five years ago. Mm. The funny thing is, it's just coming up again. Yeah. To get into his house, every window, of course, had uh, iron things over. The front door had an iron... Yeah. thing over it um, you went through one iron thing you came to a door you went through the door you came to another <laughs> iron thing you went into your bedroom and your bedroom had an iron mm. thing across the door they had radio communication wow. not with the police but with the other farmers so if one of them was being attacked the other farmers would come to help wow. not the police yeah, so it's changing. Do you have so, any plans to go back? Or? Well, no, because um, it was going to be the one country in Africa that would really shine out. Mm. And because of our relations with it, when I shot this story on the farm, on the, what was happening to the farmers, mm. German magazines, French magazines used it. Nobody in this country would touch it. Now that things are, you know, getting worse. On that last trip, walking around Hillbrow, which when I lived, I lived in Hillbrow when I was there, now I had to hire a guy with a gun to walk behind me whilst I was shooting. Wow. <laughs> uh, only twice in my life have I had to do that. Yeah. Once in Naples when I was doing a story on the Camorra, and this guy stopped me being mugged twice in a morning. Yeah. It's it's kind of sad yeah. um, understandable and I think I think the present guy is probably a good guy but the guy before you know yeah. it didn't work that well yeah. that's really interesting and that's your eight photographs and, and, and thank you so much for that, that wonderful insight and I'm sure you've got a lot of people really fascinated with your, with your insight into your work in terms of your book, which you take, uh, Minimato, is a really interesting book. Obviously, I think there's, there's massive influence with Smith in, in who you are, I think, in the way he approached his documentary work. What was it about that book which you would take with you? What did it? I think the thing about Smith was that, you know, in the early days when you looked at photographic books, you looked at Cartier Bresson, you looked at Frank, you looked at was the guy who did um, New York and um, Tokyo and uh, Klein, yeah. William Klein, and Smith. He was the one guy who seemed to do stories that really mattered, 
was also a damn good photographer. Yeah. And I thought that Minimata, you know, there are photographic book, other photographic books which I love, and, you know, I mean, China in Transition by Cartier Bresson and so on, and Salgado, Exodus, you know, yeah. uh, terrific books. Um, but that, for me, is the epitome of photojournalism. Uh, it was at risk to himself. You know, he got so badly beaten up that it contributed later to his death. Yeah. And he kept going back and working on that story. And, you know, there are definitive pictures there. So not only is it a great story and a worthwhile story, it's what, for me, photojournalism is all about. It's a quite, it was like, it's like a multi-platform thing, Minimata, isn't it? It's not, well, the same multi-platform, but it, it's a picture story. Hmm. But it would lend itself now into a lot more, wouldn't it? It would lend itself now into, a, 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 you know, you, the testimonies from the people and, and, and on different, you know, with time-based media, with, with video and stuff like that. And it was something, I think, you know, somebody ahead of him's time a little bit, you know, in terms of telling hmm. a story. And people are doing it now. And, Telling a story, but on a on a, on a multi-platform level. I hope that makes sense. You know, I think what he was doing, and, and like Vietnam Inc. as well. You know, mm -hmm. it was almost like they were almost like blogs and stories, dirty years ahead of everybody. And Vietnam mm -hmm. Inc. Was, a, it was was incredible. And actually, I, I feel a little bit like that with with your book as well. I think you followed that a little bit, and you've given that story, and you've given a. A, a different visual pattern in it, but there's, there's, it's almost like a blog in a sense. It's a long-term study covering all the different aspects of it. And I thought Vietnam Inc. was very good like that and Minimal too, you know. Great. I hope I make sense saying that. It, it, yeah. No, I, you know, Philip's book, I think, is a definitive, uh, definitive war photography book. Yeah. Um, no question of it. Just um, so ahead of its time, wasn't it? You know, he just went on shooting and, you know, it was great. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I've been working on another project for more than 10 years yeah. now, um, but which has got more expensive to do because it's worldwide and it's now really expensive to travel. Yeah. I don't know quite why I'm doing it because at the end of the day, it might be a book, but nobody's interested, that interested in the subject, or not that interested yeah. anyway in the subject. You can't get any editorial people to back. The only backing I get these days is from odd NGOs to go yeah. and shoot on it yeah. because of the market. Yeah. I mean, young photographers have to pick on a big project and work on it forever yeah. and try and make a living doing other stuff on the side. Yeah. You know, whatever it is, yeah. uh, because they're not going to get the backing from a magazine. Yeah. You know, you look at the Sunday Times magazine yeah. these days, you know, you, you, you think about what it was when Don was working there, yeah. and all the colour supplements are the same. Yeah. A, they'll run things that are for free. Yeah. They'll run things to publicise a book. Uh, they'll run sort of portraits which can be shot in half the day but they won't assign anyone to go out and really shoot something, yeah. spend time on it. Yeah. There's hardly anybody left, actually. So young photographers, I feel sorry for them. You know, I, I've been lucky all my life. Lucky because there was a market. Yeah. You know, when I was doing Africa, the bureau chief in Magnum would go to Parry Match and say, you know, Ian Barry wants to go and do this in, in South Africa. And the guy would say, well, it might be interesting for us. We'll give them a couple of thousand for the first look. So your expenses were covered. Now, if you go to Max and say, yes, that sounds interesting, let's have a look when he comes back. Yeah. You know, they're not going to put any money up yeah. front. Massive um, shift, hasn't it? It's, it's just, uh, I, I don't know how young photographers do it. I really yeah. don't. In terms of that camera which you would take with you and that brick of film, what would be your film and what would be your camera and lens you would take with you, have by your side? Well, I take digital. Would you? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd say that. Um, and uh, I take a computer. 
and I take a lot of large memory cards <laughs> and I chew to it. Are you in love with digital now? Is it that sort of thing? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would take a, I, I've got a, in my bag there, I've got a Pan F, Pan F, Pan F Olympus yeah. camera, which is like a Leica. Uh, is which the, one? Which is the Olympus? Well, you've got an Olympus, did you think? Yeah. Which one? It depends. It's called a Pan Am. Uh, yeah, I love the Olympus. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a great little camera. Yeah, and great. It's quiet. You can shoot. I mean, I personally don't shoot above about 1600. Yeah. But when you think what I could shoot at on HP5, yeah. you know, 800 was pushing the boat yeah. out. You know, you knew you'd have... It's noiseless, is it? You'd have grain like ping pong ball. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, uh, you know, digital, it's... I know there are other cameras that can shoot higher, yeah. but the, the combination of being small, quiet, having the viewfinder where the Leica is... Access. Um, you know, it, it's just it's second nature. I can, yeah. it, it's like picking up a Leica. And there's not like, you know, you're not running down to Metro now with 14, 15, 1600 rolls of film. Exactly. <laughs> and losing a mortgage on it, you know. And, and, and as it's, you know, it, I think young kids now have never really experienced that whole film process, you know, and, and there's so much they've missed out on. But in the same way, I, I, I absolutely am with you with digital. I love it. I love that. And I'm pleased I've experienced film. I've shot a book myself mm -hmm. on film. And I love it, and it's beautiful, and you can't beat a silver mm. print picture on the wall. And, but at the same time, digital offers you something much more, it's different, isn't it? It's there, it's, you can, it's, it's personal, you can keep it, you can look at it. And it don't. is, but there is one big downside. It used to be at Magnum, even here, that everybody's contact sheets were kept here. And when I lived in Paris, I could go into Paris at night, into the office, the Magnum office, and I could look at the contact sheets. Mm. And that taught me how people looked, how That's people what I mean. thought. That's exactly what I, I mean. I could see how the mind was and how the thing. Young photographers can't do that anymore. Mm. So you get crap like that on the wall, um, which. Um, I'm not pointing to whatever is, it was. It's <laughs> me meaningless, you know. <laughs> Absolutely meaningless. You know, they can't see what's gone before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All they can do is look at the present magazines, yeah. and the magazines in this country are not that great. Yeah. They're aimed at students yeah. for the most part. And they're, you know, the, uh, the colour magazines rarely do serious stories. Yeah. I mean, I think in this year I've done two stories for English magazines, one for the Observer and one for the uh, 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 Telegraph magazine, yeah. uh, and that's it in this country. You know. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Something you said to me many years ago, and I was always stuck in my head, and I've used it. And then you said you can never delete an egg. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and I was something, and I'm listening to you well, saying, "Oh, I was expecting you to say the Leica M6 with a nice 400." T-Max or something, and then you've gone, oh, I'll take me Olympus pen. <laughs> That's something I would never, ever imagine you would come out with. It's fantastic. I've learned a lot, actually. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's a great little camera. What's next? Why have you still got this relentless pursuit of taking pictures? It's never left you. What's going on? What's happening? Where are you going next? What's well, the next big project? Water? I, or This, right now, I was supposed to be in Vietnam. It was scrubbed at the last minute. And that's what happens a lot these days. You don't know until you're on the aeroplane. I'm, you know, I'm doing exhibitions because um, I sell quite a lot of prints now. It enables me to fund my other project, uh, you know, to go and shoot for myself. And I'm doing a couple of other projects, and one which I, I don't want to talk about, but the other one yeah. is uh, I'm just shooting in China. Uh, you know, I've done the length of the Yangtze, and mm. the, but, um, but China's great because it has such variety. Yeah. Um, I've also had another job scrubbed at the end of last year, which was on, and I was going, they'd invited myself and an American photographer, and I'd been, it was a new, a new city. Yeah. Um, 
And they're doing a lot of interesting things now. You know. Who's inspiring you now? Sorry. Who's out there now who's inspiring you? Who's well, we've now? got one guy, a Norwegian guy, who's Sebastian, um, Jonas Bendixson, who works a lot for Geographic, but he also works a lot for himself. And he's exactly in that Magnum tradition. And there aren't many in the Magnum tradition. Mm. Uh, and he's making a living, he's doing great stuff, he's shooting great stories. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, you've got people like Alex Webb, who is a terrific color photographer. Uh, you know, he's absolutely uh, brilliant. And you're going to be here for a bit? I've got, I've got to go um, to, um, I've got to go um, down to meet some of the, the um, Still, I've not met you since 1996. So finally, just regarding your English journey, and do you think that's something you, you've not, you've regretted never going back to in a sense, in terms of you, you, you looked at it in the 70s. Is there any chance that you look at the English again? Well, there are some good guys shooting. I mean, you know, uh, Patrick Ward has just done a great thing on London. Uh, Bryn Campbell is doing stuff. And of course, Homer Sykes is always beavering away. Um, and it's good to see John Warmer's old stuff, which he's bringing out again. No, I think there's a lot of stuff around, but um, there are still photographers out there that make you take another look and think about where you're going. That's what I was thinking. Okay. You know, I mean, this, this guy, Russian guy, member of Magnum, Yogi Pinkashov, it just sees light in a way that I would never see it. And, and I love looking at his stuff. I couldn't do it. It wouldn't be what I would do. But, um, you know, it inspires you to go out and do, keep, keep shooting. Um, no, there are, there are some good, um, most of the young photographers are good at work out of Paris, where there's still a, an atmosphere in the Paris office of Magnum, you know, in the tradition of Magnum, doesn't exist here. No, there are still good photographers around. Um, Finally, just really, light is what you're after, isn't it? Is it light which really, which you see, does that have and add the perspective onto things when you are in an environment, the light, is that where it all meets? With well, you? I, I kind of use the light. I'm not, I don't use it the way that Pinkershoff does yeah. or in the way that Alex Webb does. You know, yeah. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, well, I think you go back to the, the County Durham stuff at the beginning of your first picture. I, I think you have in a way. You, you know? know, I still like to, to be there when it happens yeah. and to get the meaningful moment and to make a shape out of it. Yeah. And that's kind of, a, you know, it's never going to make me a millionaire, but uh, yeah. it, it, I, I've had an enjoyable life. I've been lucky. Yeah. I've lived through... You've worked the, hard for it, though. I've, well, I've lived through the good times. Yeah. There aren't good times now, I don't yeah. think, in, uh, in, in my kind of... in the Magnum yeah. way of working. Yeah. Uh, if there is a magnum way of working out, we all work differently, but I mean, yeah. with the same end yeah. thinking. Yeah. Um, well, now I'm going to cast you away, and I hope the light's good for you with your massive hard drive and your Olympus pen and your pictures and your minimal pen. And I hope you have a wonderful stay. I'm not sure how long you're going to last. I'm a, I'm a rotten <laughs> so. It's so. been a total pleasure, absolute pleasure. And, and you know, you've influenced me for a long time and it's been wonderful getting a chance to sit down with you eventually to sort of listen to you talk about your life and your work and, and get an insight into how you've done things. Enjoy your stay on the island and um, I hope, I'd like to see the exhibition of it. <laughs> All the best. Good Thank to you. talk to you, lad. Good Thank to see you. you as well. Brilliant. We are floored, we are bound down, see us, careless corpse, see us, steal the dawn, we are stone. We are stone.
see us born, see us wind down, see us fly low to us.